So I think I'll kick off like a minute early, if that's okay with everyone. Um, I've left this up so that you know you're in the right session. I'm going to talk about the Git workflow for Drupal core development. And this is the first ever time I've spoken at a Drupal event, so, you know, wish me luck. But feel free to throw tomatoes if you don't like it. So, who am I? I'm uh, from New Zealand, so you're going to have to put up with this difficult accent, so sorry for that. Um, I am from New Zealand, but I didn't fly here just for today. Um, I actually live in Hackney, I've lived in London for four years, and I plan to live here a long time. Uh, I work for Acquia as a solutions architect, which means that I'm the first kind of technical person that most of our clients speak to um, within Acquia. And my job is kind of have a full project view of how Drupal's a fit, um, how the project will run out, whether the products that Acquia has are suitable for the client. And like everyone, we're trying to make people successful with Drupal. So I'm trying to make sure that we're not going way down the wrong path. Uh, I'm a, I wouldn't call myself a, a big contributor, but I call myself a casual contributor to Drupal for maybe a couple of hours uh, every, every couple of weeks. And I do a few simple modules on D.O. as well. Um, and uh, I try to get along to like, local sprints and events like this to help new contributors as much as I can. Um, and I think the reason for that is, you know, personally in my career, like, two big things happened that really you know, made a big difference. One of them was choosing Drupal um, is the thing I wanted to focus on. But definitely the second thing was becoming involved in core development uh, and con contribution in general because, you know, we always talk in open source about standing on the shoulders of giants in relation to the product of the code, um, but also there's a lot of stuff that goes with that, best practices, um, you know, how to run a project, uh, how to work with best-in-class tools. When you're dealing with thousands and thousands of developers, you need to get this stuff right. So you might, may or may not recognise my handle there, um, cam8001 on Drupal Org IC and Twitter. Uh, I'll leave it for, as an exercise for anyone interested to figure out what those numbers mean. Okay, so uh, do you guys all know what version control is? I'm looking around. No, not too many blank faces. Okay, that's good. That'll make things a bit easier. <laughs> um, okay, so, you know, there's two main types of version control, uh, broadly. One is what we call like a traditional, like something like CVS or SVN, which many of you may have worked with. Uh, personally, when I started my career, SVN was kind of the most prominent version control system. Uh, and what they have in common is that everything kind of lives on a central server. That is the authoritative source of record. Um, whenever you make a change, commit an update, it goes to the central server. Something like Git is a little bit different. It's, called, it's what's called a distributed version control system. So that means that everyone who uses Git uh, has a complete and total copy of the version control repository. So the version that I have sitting on my laptop uh, is exactly the same as what is on Drupal.org and is on other people's laptops um, all over the world. And that's, uh, it sort of doesn't really mean anything when you say it like that, but it actually becomes very powerful, uh, which is what I'm going to try and show you today. Uh, the advantage of kind of having it locally is a few things. One is that it makes things really fast. So if you need to make a change and log uh, an update, it's happening on your local machine. You don't have to ping across the internet and say, hey, I made a change to the code. Uh, you don't have to contend with 10,000 other developers who are trying to do the same thing. Uh, it also means that you can go crazy locally and bugger up your system. Um, no one's going to see it except you unless you want them to. So you can really experiment, and that gives you a lot of freedom. Um, and another sort of advantage of Git is that Every action that you do pushes data into the system. There's very, very few operations that uh, destroy data permanently. So you can kind of go mad uh, and have the safety um, that of always being able to go back. So everything's sitting locally. Um, you've got it there somewhere. You just have to dig it out. So whether or not um, we're using CVS, which is what Drupal used to use uh, before uh, it switched to Git in 2011, or Git, um, there's actually only a few people who can change Drupal, the Drupal that we all download from Drupal.org. And these people are the Drupal 8 maintainers. So even though we can do all this crazy stuff locally, we can't actually change what's happening on Drupal at all. We're still working on a kind of patch-based workflow which uses files as the medium of exchange. So we upload patches, they get reviewed, and then only these people can actually put it into Drupal. 
Okay. So if you don't presently uh, either use Git, it would be cool development. There's a few things I kind of want to talk about doing before we would go into how we would set up a workflow for core development. The first thing is that you should really be using the CLI. And so I mean the command line interface, the terminal by that. Now a lot of people when they're starting, they, you know, they may not use a terminal day to day, they may not be particularly comfortable with it. But if you're using Git, it's, uh, it's what everyone uses. All the things you see on the internet, all the references, all the tutorials will assume that you're using the command line. Um, Git is an open source project as well, and the sort of canonical interface is the command line, so it's where the buck stops. So you really, if you don't use the command line and you don't use Git on the command line, you really should. It'll make your life a lot easier. And I can always help, and there's a lot of people who are happy to help you with that. Um, if you're on OS 10, use Brew. Uh, just Google for Brew Package Manager, it's really good. If you're on Linux, you probably don't need a hand, but you'll have a package manager and it's probably already installed on your distro. And if you're on Windows, uh, go to Drupal.org because I don't know that much about Windows. But you can use Sigwin or you can, uh, you can download it directly and use it internally. The other thing you need to do is get that copy of uh, the repository that I spoke about. So you use this command called git clone and that'll get a total and complete copy of Drupal and all of its history. So if you see here, I don't know how, can you guys see that okay? Yeah, so you, all of the commands in git uh, work in this format, so you've got the git command and then you pass a secondary command which is an action for git to do and then any uh, arguments come after that. So in this case I'm asking git to do a clone and I'm going to go give me the 8.x branch because I want to work on Drupal 8 uh, and this is the repository that I want to clone to have locally. It will effectively, like, it's just downloading a big blob of binary data but it does it in objects. Uh, it'll take a while but you kind of have to have that to kind of get started. Depending on your internet connection, it might take a few minutes. And you really do get a complete copy. You can see here that I uh, perhaps find the earliest commit. This is from 14 years ago. So this is Dries' very first uh, commit to Drupal ever. And you can actually check out that copy of Drupal and install it if it worked, I don't know, um, and see what Drupal was like originally. So. How do we actually do a workflow? I've divided it up into six steps. Um, I said, you know, Git's quite a big thing uh, and it's a big open source project, so I'm trying to narrow it down as, as, uh, into as funneled a workflow as possible. If um, I might skip over some bits, but feel free to interrupt me with questions if, if I'm not being clear. So, first thing is you want to create an issue branch. Second, make your changes, that's the fun bit. The third thing is to stage your changes. Commit them, make a patch file, and then put it on the internet for review, right? So, what is a commit? So a commit's a single change set. Uh, it's relative to a repository in the file system. Um, and kind of, if you've got a computer science degree, you might know this a little better than me, but every uh, commit is a snapshot, so and kind of a more traditional version control system, uh, every commit would be like a, a set of changes. So you might have a file and then you add some text and you add some more and each one of those is like a log. And as you build up that log, you begin to build out your repository. From a human point of view, that makes a lot of sense. But Git uh, internally, or in Linux toolbox here, stores it as snapshots. So at any point, at any commit in history, you can go straight back and get a complete copy of everything. Every commit has an author and a timestamp and a message. So you're talking about who did it, when they did it, and why they did it. Okay, so what's a branch? A branch is a, a stream of commits. Um, it has a full history. You can have a single repository that has many, many branches, effectively an infinite number of branches for practical purposes. And you can branch off at any point in history. Or merge, merge uh, divergent branches back together. And you know, things like uh, Pressflow or Backdrop, that's what they did. They, they rewound Drupal to a point they liked. They said, we want a branch here, and they made a branch. When they do it like Backdrop does it, it's called a fork, but it's the same thing. So, before I go into uh, the sort of can demo, I just want to talk about the three states files can have. So you see this kind of blue circle? That is um, a git directory. So in a clone um, git from Drupal.org, uh, sorry, clone the repository from Drupal.org, 
have downloaded into a local directory, and that's what that represents. So in my machine, it's uh, you know utility sites, so my user directory sites, Drupal. Then internally, Dr uh, Git has what's called a staging area. So when I go into my repository and I start working in the working directory and I make modifications, Git knows that that's happening. And when I check it, it tells me, it says you've modified that file and this file, and this is what you've done to it. Uh, then I can say, I want to put it into the internal Git staging area, and I can prepare up, um, you know, I could add a new file, I could make a one line change to a file, I could do a 10,000 line change to every file in the system, or I could remove files. But that all sits in the staging area, safely tucked away until you're ready to go back to commit it, which is when you add your uh, message to say what you're doing, uh, and it gets locked into the repo, uh, and you've got that snapshot in time, so you can always go back to that point. So who cares about all this stuff, right? You actually want to see it happening. So let's do it. First thing you need to do is actually find something to work on. So this is an issue that I've been working on over the last couple of months. Uh, it's to do with um, there's a table in Drupal 7 and in Drupal 8 at the moment called Patch Form, um, which isn't really a patch. It's kind of like a, an authentication uh, like log so that when I uh, generate a form, I know that it was actually generated by Drupal and someone's not trying to do some cross-site scripting or put bad post out uh, when they're submitting a form. And the problem is if you have a site that uses a particular module like a um, five star, or they have a lot of comments, these ideal comments, or something like that. That table can get massive. Like we have um, at Active, we've got a client who is putting 90 gigs a day into that uh, table. And that's the problem if you need to replicate it, back it up, um, and obviously it makes the whole, the whole database crawl. So I want to get rid of that in Drupal 7. That's fine, really easy fix, but I'm, well, fortunately, uh, if we fix it in Drupal 7 but don't fix it in Drupal 8, when Drupal 8 comes out, the bug will still exist, and people who are on Drupal 7 will say, well, I thought this bug was fixed in Drupal, so I need to move it into Drupal 8, and that's what I'm trying to do here. Anyway, <coughs> excuse me. If you've, um, you know, if you're a programmer by day, or you've worked on other projects, you might be aware of, uh, of like the concept of an issue tracker. So there'd be something like Jira, or, or Redmine, or Mantis, where you would have you know, an issue number against every bug in your system. Well, we have one on Drupal, uh, which is Drupal. Drupal uses a, a, a module called Project, and every um, issue in the issue queue has a node ID, and that becomes our issue number. And that's kind of the unique identifier that we're going to use to keep track of the changes we're doing in core. So the first thing we want to do, step one of our workflow, is create an issue branch. So using that same format of git and then a command, in this case we're doing checking out, getting a new copy of the code. The minus b argument says to create a new branch. This third argument is a name for the branch. So you can see here, I've used the number that I showed you in the last slide as a prefix for the name. Then I put a little brief description of the issue just for my own benefit so that when I'm looking through I don't have to go back to Drupal Ward and check every node so I can figure out what I was working on. So I hit enter and you see that uh, the command line tells me that I switched a new branch and I use a little utility that shows me the branch name uh, on the command line so I don't have to check it. I can just see instantly on my PS1 what's there. But you could always use uh, the git branch command to show you the active branches in your local repository. You can see there that the branch I just created is green and it has a star beside it to indicate that that's the branch I'm on. We've also got the 8.x branch, which I can switch back to if I want to at any time. Sure. Is this all the Sorry? Yeah. So uh, the question was, is this only happening locally? And the answer is yes, definitely. So it's only sitting in um, my local machine. No one else is going to see it unless I want them to. Um, you can do all of this stuff privately and go crazy, and you're not kind of going to break something that you don't want to. Um, you've got the freedom to experiment. So, the second part is kind of the most important one, right? You want to make the changes. This part is actually kind of the best part, <laughs> the bit that you should be spending most of your time on. And the thing that I see, like, 
again and again when I'm doing Drupal Ladder or whatever is people get really hung up and stuck on the Git part and they end up not concentrating on the bit we want, which is to improve Drupal. And, you know, this is hard. It's not going to fit into this presentation. We've been doing it for 14 years and we still haven't got Drupal 8 out. So, have fun. Do this bit. Enjoy it. Once I've done, made my changes, um, stuff goes into the modified state. So I run my git status command and it'll show the state of things that are sitting on my local machine. So, you can see that I've got this file here changed. Um, core lib Drupal core form form builder.php um, and you've got this message here saying that it's not staged, right? So it's in the modified state. Uh, git knows that it's modified but it has, you've elected not to keep a record of that. Well, what if I want to know what's modified? When you're editing a whole file system, it can be hard to keep track of exactly what you did. I run the git diff command. I use the path that uh, git told me about, and I get this nice format, which you'll get very used to reading. You can see these two lines here. I'm not sure how well it shows up on the projector. have little minus, sides, uh, minus symbols beside them, meaning that they've been, they've been removed. This one in green has a plus symbol, meaning that it's been added. And you can see here, if you can read that, that I've converted uh, a hard-coded variable into using CMI. That's a change I want to commit. So now I want to move it into the staging state. And we're, all, we're still working locally. And for the, in this case, I use the command git add. So it's the same file, same path that we spoke about before. You can see that now I've got changes to be committed when I run git status. It's the same file, it's, got, it's been coloured green, um, and it says modified. So nothing's actually changed in the file. It, this hasn't made any changes. If I was to open this file in my IDE or my text editor, you wouldn't see any changes. All we're doing is telling the git index, this change is to be committed. So let's commit it. This is the command, right? So once again git, we hit commit, and we code minus m. Minus M means message. You want to put in a simple message that will read clearly on one line, and I'll show you one of the reasons why that is. Um, basically, it's the convention. You should stick to it. And it's quite, I find these kind of best practices a good like, mental discipline. If I need four lines to describe what I'm changing, then my commits are probably too big. So you want to be able to go back and look. When I, hit, when I do do the commit, you can see that I get a message saying, with my branch name, uh, one file changed, I inserted one line and I deleted two. If I run the log, you can see that here we've got a commit by Dries, obviously from Drupal.org, and then my commit sits on top of that. There's 21 hours between when he made that commit and I made my commit. Okay, so that's great. It's all sitting locally as we said. But what if we want to make a patch file and put it on Drupal.org? A patch file is just exactly what we saw with just then when I have the minus and plus. It's a commit change set. The only difference is it's saved in a text file. So when I upload that patch file to Drupal.org, <laughs> the test bots pick it up. Um, so Drupal.org has these, uh, what's called QA.Drupal.org running all the time, which will scan for new patches. Uh, we'll apply them to Drupal core and run a whole bunch of automated tests. I think we're running something like 65,000 uh, simple test tests and a whole bunch of PHP unit tests as well. The other key thing, which is actually, we can get hung up on the tech, but the whole point is that other contributors can download it. They can apply it to their local Git repository. They, maybe they just want to apply it and use it to fix an issue they're having, or maybe they want to work on it too. So, what do I do? First, I run Git diff again. But you can see that I've put a different argument. And what I have here is what's called a, a remote. So you can see I've got this origin slash 8.x. So you saw before I was actually just typing branch names directly. Here I'm typing a branch name and a forward slash. This origin indicates upstream. In this case, upstream is Drupal.org. You can have a whole bunch of upstreams, um, and there's reasons that you might want to do that. But for the purposes of this, we just got one. The upstream repository that we originally cloned from is sitting on Drupal. So show me the difference between what I've got locally and what Drupal.org has. You can see I get the same diff with the same lines. Uh, the format is slightly different in that um, we have 
uh, an indication of the line are the A and B states. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to redirect the output and push it into a patch file. So if you've used uh, bash um, before, you may know about uh, redirection of input and output. This is just a little greater than symbol. It's taking the output of this command that I ran here and pushing it into this file here. So that file is just going to have exactly the same as this. The only difference is we're missing some colours. But you can't have colours in a plain text file, right? That's it. So does anyone know, does anyone see a floor here? There's a big clue in the title. The floor is that while I've been working away, and bear in mind it was 21 hours since Teresa did a commit, there could have been a whole lot of stuff happening on Drupal at all, right? A whole lot of stuff. And my local copies from 21 hours or even longer ago. So I need to get a copy of um, what has happened since on Drupal.org and bring it into my local machine and then make sure that the changes I've made are still compatible. And that's what we do it through a mechanism called rebase. So there's, you've probably heard of merging and rebasing. Um, they're two different ways of applying local changes. So what merging does is it kind of tries to zip the changes together into single changes. So if you had two changes to the same file, it would try to match them together and make it as one. What rebasing does is it rewinds to the point before you made any changes, puts all the new changes from Drupal.org on top, and then applies your changes on top of those. So let's see that happen. The first thing that happens that we need to do is do a fetch. So this is yet another git command, which is a fetch. It pulls all the new changes down in the last however long since I, I last did a pull or a fetch. You can see um, I'm only bringing down 857 objects instead of the hundreds of thousands I did when I did a clone. Um, it'll download much more quickly and then uh, all of these changes will be added to origin. And I'll talk about that in a second. Then we run the rebase command, right? It's yet another command to get. It's just literally rebase. And I specify what the um, branches that I want to rebase on top of. So when I rewind, what am I referring to? Then what am I putting on top? I'm going to put the stuff from origin 8.x. And you can see here that in my actual patch that's actually on Drupal.org, I've got a lot more changes than I had in the demo before. So there's something like 10 or so here. Small changes um, which then are applied on top of the stuff that I've fetched in the step before. And once I actually run the log, um, you can see we've now got a change from Drupal.org from 11 hours ago. Um, the hash number at the front is different, which is the unique identifier for the commit. And then you can see my name in blue uh, all the way up here with my commit sitting on top. So that's a much cleaner way. The key benefit um, of rebase is that you get a single history. So if you've done merging, if you merge at your day block, you often see these commits that are like uh, merge origin 8.x. And you see like heaps of those as everyone pulls down the day, um, pulls down the copy from upstream. That doesn't happen with the rebase. You have a single history. So you don't have your branches going all over the place and merging back together. Uh, so it's much cleaner. Now to make life a lot easier for everyone, especially you, a key thing to help you when you're doing this is to commit, keep your commits really small. One of the key things it does is it makes it easier to rebase. So instead of having to match, like if you have a change that in total is like 50 lines, if you do a rebase or a merge, Git's got to go, well, I've got to match up 50 lines, then I've got to try and stuff that in there, and that's a lot, lot harder than matching up a couple of lines, adding that a couple more lines 25 times. Another thing is it's, uh, sorry? Yeah. Can I just ask, if you'd done a get pull before you did your commit, you wouldn't need to do a rebase, is that right? So shouldn't you just have that as your... Um, yeah, your pretty much everyone likes doing get pulls except me. Um, I'm trying to always get people to do get fetches. What I don't like about get pulls is that they fit, it's like, it's basically a shortcut to doing a fetch in the merge, mm -hmm. but it has to kind of necessarily make all these assumptions about what you want to do, um, and you can get into trouble. Now you, most of the time it will work, and in fact the concept is really similar, but you will more often than, you know, more often than with rebates at least, get issues coming up where the merge isn't quite clean enough. 
but yeah, the majority of people will do get full when it'll work. Um, I think we, the community generally recommends rebasing this like the way I like to do it. Okay. Um, some other things that are good about having small commits um, is that if you need to revert like a small part of, of the changes you made, you only need to revert one commit. You don't need to unpick one big commit and just pick out the lines that you want to revert. You can just say, oh, I changed that name from cache expire form to cache form expire. I don't want to do that anymore. I only have to pick out that commit. It's one, just one command instead of a whole hassle of trying to dig it out. Um, it's easy to understand. You only have to look at a small amount of code uh, rather than trying to read a massive change set. Um, and also you get like, because I said before that you have this one line message, so it's very easy to read in this format, but if I have 50 commits instead of one commit that's 50 times as big, I get 50 little notes, which is great. So that's just a nice little record for you. Um, yeah, so keep your patches small. Your commits small. It'll make your life easier. Okay, so once that's all done, we've got our patch file set up. We want, if you want to share it, this is when you upload your patch. And this is when you're sharing what you've done locally with the rest of the community and with Drupal.org. So um, I'm still getting used to the new form. This changed when uh, Drupal switched, Drupal all switched over from Drupal 6 and Drupal 7. Basically, that page I was on before where I was showing you the issue in the description, you scroll down, at the bottom of the page, you have this add new comment. There's a few things you need to remember when you're uploading your patch. First, of course, is to upload your patch, which is what you can see down here. It's kind of hard to see in the screenshot, but there's a widget here for uploading files. So you take the patch file that you created on the command line, you choose it, and you upload it. Yep. So where do you get the patch file? Uh, where, where is this? Okay, so remember um, I showed before I went to like Drupal or station over and then I have an issue number and it will have at the top it will have a description of the issue and have a series of patches. So that's the issue tracker. If I go to that page and scroll down, this is where I can add the Yeah. So you need to set um, your issues and needs review. Uh, you kind of can't see because of this, uh, this drop down over the top, but this is a status field, um, which is a field on the comment. You've got a whole lot of statuses. What you need to do is set it to needs review. And that does a couple of things. First, it tells um, the test bots, hey, can you please pick this up? There's a new patch file, please grab it, apply it, run it, and email me if there's any errors. And it will also change the status of the issue on Drupal. <coughs> the other thing it does is it actually tells people to pick it up, which is the whole point, right? So when, I, when you go to Drupal.org and you go to the issue queue, you go, show me all the patches that need review or need work, and then you know to, to look at it and work on it. You also need to add an actual comment <coughs> because uh, you, know, you need to communicate what you're actually trying to do here. This is a pretty terse one. Um, usually you'd be a little bit friendlier and chattier, but stuff can be value for unit tests. So this is from a real, um, a real commit that I was doing. And this is what we're trying to get to, right? So you can see up here that this is the, uh, an uploaded patch. Now this is another issue, exactly the same concept though. You can see here that we've got the URL of the issue. Um, it's got a stream of comments. One of them is number 39 where Peter Wallenden has uploaded a patch. You can see here that in the smaller text, simple test has passed 64,687 times. There's been no failures. That's really good news. That means that the patch applies cleanly and it's not breaking any existing functionality. To get a patch in, it has to pass the test. There's just no, that's non negotiable, right? But it also needs someone to come along and also say, hey, this patch looks good and I think it should be in Drupal. Many times, um, people will go, this patch has got these issues or I think you should try this. And that happens a lot. Especially if you're a new contributor and you don't have the backstory, try not to get too discouraged by that. That's just the flow. I mean, when I started, it was like, okay, cool, I spent a day with this patch, I'm really proud that I got it up there, and then an hour later, someone goes, no, sorry, man. And I thought, well, I spent a whole day, shouldn't it be in Drupal? But that's quite how Drupal works. It takes time. You've got to look at an agreement from a lot of people. Um, you've got to consider the needs of like the millions of people who use Drupal. And it does take time. I mean, the issue that I was showing you before, I first posted it in September, right? I'm going to try and get it committed this weekend, but there's certainly no guarantees. 
<coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so for this, in this case, um, someone said, yeah, I do like this, and they've changed the status to reviewed and tested by the community. That's what we're trying to get to every time, RTBC. One, once it gets to RTBC, one of those call committers that I showed you before will see it, they will do a final review, and if they're happy, they will commit it. When an issue changes to this status, they commit it to the uh, Drupal.org uh, copy of the Git repository and gets put into Drupal. So this is where we're trying to get to. And you did it, right? You made Drupal better. And it's a really good feeling if you've ever done, um, if you've ever had a, a patch accepted, it, it does feel really good, seeing your name on the commit credit uh, and knowing that a little bit of Drupal is yours. Well, or that you help with a little bit of Drupal. Okay. So, Git's a big topic. Um, a lot of this will probably, you know, either be irrelevant or pass you by or whatever. It's hard to pack it into half an hour. But if you remember one thing, it's to do a branch per issue. This makes your life a lot, lot easier. Um, because every time you do an issue, you just create a new branch. Even if you're not particularly tending to do any work on it, you're just having a look. If you, it gives you the freedom to experiment. So I might see that issue and go, well, I don't know, maybe I want to apply find patches, or maybe I want to just test it and maybe chuck in some garbage debugging data, put out some echo statement. If you branch it, you can do that. It also means that you can be working on completely separate issues uh, and have them completely isolated from each other. <coughs> so when I check out the 8.x issue, I go back to Drupal head. But I go back to this one, which I was working on a long time ago. It's exactly back to where it was months and months ago. Um, you can switch really easily, um, really quickly. They're cheap. Um, in fact, well, when I was doing a bit of research, apparently it only needs to write 40 bytes of data to do a new branch, which is not very much. Um, they take no time at all. You can just like, effectively instantly create one. And you can branch at any point. Um, yeah, create one for every issue. And everything is a branch, right? Which I'll talk about a little bit more in a second. You can branch from a branch. You can go back in time and branch from there. Or you can go forward and branch from there and branch from that and branch from that. Uh, and no one else is ever going to see them unless you want to. You can't break Drupal with your local bit. You just can't. Uh, the only time that you can break code is when you've got push access to a repository. So if you're a contributor module, um, you have a contributor module on Drupal.org and you push, you can break some code. But for Drupal core, you can do whatever you like and don't be scared. You're not going to affect anything in the wild. If you remember one more thing, that's what I was saying before. Everything is a branch. Everything is a branch. <laughs> Everything is a branch, right? And the reason I bang on about this so much is that once I really understood this, and it took me a long time, um, I really felt like I understood Git a lot better. Um, because I was used to working in SVN, and you know, every time you branch, you make a full copy of the code. That's not how Git works. It's kind of this magic thing that this can make a branch out of anything. So every single commit can act as a fully functional branch. I can just commit, uh, I can go check out, put the commit ID, even if I was on Drupal 4.7 and I said, please check out um, the commit that I did on Drupal 8 yesterday, boom, everything changes instantly. And you can just flop around, grab everything. It's, it's, it's really cool, I really like it. Every tag's a branch. So you can, if you've tagged the code and you've released it, you can check it out and work on it as though it was development code. Even uh, your remote upstream stuff, so this is kind of one of the weirdest um, concepts to get your head around, is that even stuff that's sitting on Drupal.org, as far as Git's concerned, is just local stuff. So when I did my fetch, I copied everything from Drupal.org into my local repository. So even though I'm kind of referring to the upstream, nothing happens until I push. Everything in the upstream sits locally. So everything's branch. So... This is one really good use case um, for having lots of branches. And that's having a branch with all your fixes on it and a branch with all your tests on it. So that means that you can switch back and forth really quickly. And remember, it's like instant. Um, run your test, the test fails. OK, check out my fix. Test passes. So git check out. I have, this is actually funny. This is when I used to use the reverse. I've just realized uh, having the number at the end. but. You get the idea. And then I just suffix it with fixes. I do exactly the same thing and do tests. 
So does your test, does your fixing branch include tests as well, test as well, with one branch on top of the other? So what I generally do is uh, I go back to before I did any work, I do two branches with fixes and tests, and then I merge the two when I'm ready. Right. So my final branch, which has, which will end up being committed, hopefully, is a merge of those two. Right, right. So yeah. I, I tend to do one on the tip of the other, but then when you rebase, you kind of make a max. You rebase one draft that's appended to another. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I guess this is kind of the thing about. I always encourage people to do branch. Like, it's kind of like a backup. Like, so you get into that situation, it's like, I'll just go back. Yeah, I do back up the branches as well. Yeah. I get, check out temp, yeah. and then do whatever rebasing I need to do, and then div against temp, and if there's no changes, I know I've not lost anything mm -hmm. in rebase commit conflicts and things like that. Absolutely, and you yeah. can get yourself into real yeah. hairy situations. And then, and then <laughs> once you know you're clear, just delete the temp branch. Yep, totally. So don't be afraid to branch. That's an answer to my question. You can delete a branch if you don't want it. Yep, you can delete a branch locally with just git remove. Yep. Pretty easy. And the branches are all locally the, the, the same as doesn't know all the No. It's no way from Yep, so you delete that branch. You could delete 8.8. You're not going to delete Drupal. Yeah. Anyone have a question? Yeah. You said that they're just locally. How do you know which branch is actually locally and which branch is not? Actually, quite often, if you do a patch and it requires new tests, which is really common, you'll quite often be asked by whoever, can you please upload a patch where the tests work, but if they fail, it was even the fix, and then a final patch. Because so that we need to see, like, does your test actually work? So this, um, the test should branch from, like, the most recent copy of Drupal. So because, you know, in practice, you would probably write the fix first, because, you know, that's the whole point, right? And then once you work out how to fix the issue, you go back and write your tests. So before I even start, if I know I'm writing tests, I would do two right at the start. I would work on the fixes, then I check out this, that rewind me again. I run my tests, I hack away and write and get them right. Once I'm done, I merge them together and I upload them. actually not a merge command on that slide, and it should be, but yeah, get merge is just another just small description. Yeah. Oh, there is the merge, okay. Yeah, so once I'm on this branch, my test and fixes, I do the merge. Um, and so this is kind of weird, like, when I say merge this, it'll be on the active branch that I'm on. So I'm sitting on the, um, the test and fixes branch, which, move, which branch from the test branch, then I merge in the fixes branch, and I get my final tag. And you can see there that, in this case, it's the same commit I did before, where one file has changed, four insertions, and one deletion. <coughs> so I'm going to upload these slides, and also I'm going to be at the sprints probably tonight and probably tomorrow, so feel free to hit me up. It does take a while to get your head around this stuff, and I'll help you with whatever you need. So, it's good to have some handy tools which make your life a little bit easier. First one is actually applying a patch, which is kind of the whole point. So, it's not the most common that you'll be the only person working on a, an issue, uh, and it's usually, even if you think you've found something new, probably someone's found it before and tried to fix it already. So, you need to grab the patch uh, from Drupal.org. You can either just download it in your browser, into your downloads folder and apply it that way, or I will sometimes just copy the path and w get it to my local directory. So all I'm doing is downloading a patch file. It's nothing complicated. The command to apply a patch is git apply. And I like to throw a couple of arguments. So we've got git apply and the name of the file we just downloaded, but we've also got minus v, which is the verbose, to show what's actually happening, and index. And what index does is it puts stuff into the staging, and that doesn't make that much difference unless there's new files that have been added. So if you've downloaded a patch and you apply it without index and there's new files added, they won't get put into your patch. Or they won't get put into your commit. So please just every kind of 
for better, to make your life easier. You get to it quite otherwise. I've been burnt plenty of times before I actually understood what that meant. Uh, then I commit and I say, look, I've applied, and I just put the name of the file. And that gives me the history to go back and say, hopefully that file name's unique, and if we're following the naming convention, we've got um, the node ID and also the comment ID on the end, that's that number at the end. So I can look at the commit, I can read the name of the file and know exactly what the patch is by going to Drupal.org and reading it. So, this is a, a little Git reset, a Drupal 8 reset script. If you're switching branches all the time, you're getting Drupal from all sorts of points in history, and it's a lot easier to just reinstall Drupal than try and figure out why it suddenly doesn't work because something's changed. So this is on GitHub, it'll be linked in the um, presentation, which I'll make available for download. Um, this is just a quick shell script, and this is what it does. So when you, uh, when you, you know, need to switch branches and it doesn't work, you could either set up a database, um, set up a uh, vhost, go to install PHP, click through the installer, um, get everything enabled, put in your admin password, and it just takes time. You know, if you're if you're switching back and forth between branches five or six a day, that's going to take like ten minutes of time. That's a whole lot of wasted time. So instead, you can just run this script, and it will just install Drupal via drive. It will drop your existing database. Uh, Drupal 8 makes all these files that um, are needed for Drupal to boot. It'll delete all of those. It'll set your uh, admin user up with the password of admin. Uh, and in my case, it enables simple test for doing testing locally and the develop module for doing debugging locally. Sorry? Uh, it's, a, it's a script that I wrote called D8 Reset, but um, I'll make it available. And yeah, it's, it's, it's just doing a few things. This is a convenience thing, but you could always use Drush to do this without that script. So if you're freaking out, and you like find this really scary, don't worry, because it is kind of uh, complicated and it is a bit scary. Um, but people are here to help, right? That's why I like working in Drupal, because people are actually nice, which can be kind of rare in IT. Um, so once you actually understand it, you'll love it, right? Like it is actually really powerful and it enables you to do a lot of things really well. And this is, you know, this is Drupal. This, everyone here will be happy to help you. You can go to the sprints today or tomorrow people will help you, there's people on IC, people on Twitter, you know, we're here to help. The other thing is that this is just my opinion, man. Like, this is how I do it, and I think this is a kind of pretty standard workflow. Like, I was working at a sprint um, the other day, and Alex Pop, who's a Drupal 8 core committer, was there, and he does it basically the same way. We've got our little differences in certain things we do, but branch per issue, he does that, he does the test and fix branch, he has a naming convention with the number, you know, it's pretty standard. And he had like 350 branches, not as like a machine. <coughs> Which just shows that the branches are cheap and it's a good way to work, right? So if you don't like it, then don't do it. I mean, it's fine. But, you know, this is just here to help. And if you vehemently disagree with the way to do something, I don't know if this is the best way. It's just the way I do it. So, have we got any other questions? Yeah. So what do you use for a, um, an issue track or do you use GitHub or Bitbucket or, or SVN? Um, or we, so, or? So, so far we've, uh, we've used uh, SVN for so, the server and then uh, we, we are trying uh, GitHub now. Yeah. Okay. So, okay, so GitHub has a really nice thing and this is really a distributed version control workflow thing called uh, pull request, which you may have heard of. Um, and they enable you to um, so whenever you, you, you have an issue, it's in your tracker, and you say, okay, branch the code now. And it's kind of automated in such a way that you know that you're branching on a particular issue. Um, you can make the changes, and then you do a request to the person with push access to the main repository, please bring this in. That's the pull request. Please pull this into your repository. 
and they say, hey, I oh, don't know, you need to update this, blah, blah, blah. You go, okay, I do that. But it's all on your own version. You can have all your commits, all your history, as I've been talking about. And that workflow works really well. So that's the kind of technical side of it. There's the project side of it, which is kind of much more difficult to get right. Like if you're doing an agile development, in theory, you should really only be working on the issues that are in the particular sprint you're in. I mean, in the real world, sometimes that doesn't happen. But if you're, if you're working on enough issues at once that no one can keep track of it, there might be some problems um, in your process, right? I think that gets better for that because it allows you, like, it allows you to kind of have your little pet projects. Like I know when I was a full-time programmer, I'd have these things, oh, I really want to improve that, refactor that because it's crap or whatever. I could have it sitting in my Git repository locally, no one needed to know about it. When it inevitably came up as a bug, I'm like, yeah, I've done 60% of that. So I think it's really good. Um, and the other thing, I guess, is that you don't, like just because you have a branch pressure locally doesn't mean that anyone else has to, right? And in fact, when I worked at another company, one of the guys there um, used Git locally and he used a thing called Git plus SVM to roll stuff up to actually push it to life. Because he wanted that functionality to be able to be working on a lot of stuff at once without having to rely on the upstream. Yeah. So I know that was a pretty rambling answer, but hopefully it was helpful. Anything else? Yep. Yeah, so uh, there was just a mention of a session uh, about Git flow. I've never done Git flow. I know, kind of know what it is, but it's to deal with that issue that you were speaking about. It's a set of processes around making the best use of Git to work on a lot of issues concurrently. Um, so yeah, that would be a, a really worthy really session to go to. Um, isn't, again, not really a question. Um, just uh, something I thought I'd share. One thing I found is when you're working on a branch per issue, and say you upload a patch, based on I'm doing a diff to the 8.x main branch. Um, and then another contributor says, yeah, your patch is great, but a couple of things it gets wrong. And then they provide a new patch, and then you realize there's something else you want to do. And um, I found that there's a way of updating your branch based by just applying their patch, and then making a new commit on your branch, which is just the difference between your patch and their patch, and the trick is you have to full git into checking out 8.x so the patch applies cleanly, but still thinking it's on your feature branch. And the trick, I think I wrote about it in my blog, and my blog's offline now, you have to do git check out um, the branch name, so 8.x, but then dash dash dot, which means check out the files from this branch, but don't change branch. Which puts Git in a funny state because the files look like 8.x, but it thinks it's, it's things on your feature branch. You then apply the patch, and then suddenly you now have Git in a state where you're diverging from the branch by the difference between the two patches. Sorry, this sounds way more complicated than it is, yeah. but it's actually really simple. Then you just make a commit, and then your feature branch is now up to date with the new, the new contribute the other guy's patch. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a good example of how you can actually just pull files out of Git arbitrarily. So that uh, dash dash dot just means um, the dash dash is like a, a command separator. It's a separator yeah. between yeah, branches and files. And dot means like just get everything. The kind of, yeah. yeah, the root directory. And you can actually pull stuff from upstream branches, from commits. You can pull anything at any time. So you can just use that to download files um, out of the repository at any point, which is really cool. Another thing for that particular case is you can add interactively. So you can go get add minus p, and it will go, instead of doing a whole pack, or the whole commit, it will go, do you want to do line number three? You can go yes, no. Uh, do you want to do line number five? Yes, no. And so you can, you can uh, have a file that's changed, but only stage like half the changes or a tenth of the changes or whatever you want. But Git's like a really powerful tool and it's basically endless. So we end up having conversations like that. <laughs> that freak everyone out. Uh, all the resources, um, I'll put this up on, um, on the DriftPant website. I've put a link to the basics, Drupal Ladder, which you can do tomorrow if you want to, uh, how I was shown the branch and prompt. If you're going to be using Drush with Drupal 8, you need to get Drush 7, if this is Drupal 2. Uh, get number is a little tool that I use, which I try to get everyone to use, which means that you can just type, instead of typing get in a path, you can just uh, type in a number of a file, so you call your file 1 to 10, very handy. 
in the script that I just talked about. You can always ping me on IC or on Twitter and I'll help you out too. Um, so slides will be up there. If you want to do some call committee, come to the Tech Hub in Shoreditch. It happens monthly, organised by Robert Costello. And Aquera is hiring, so we're looking for the tech architects, DevOps, technical account managers, and solutions architects. So if you want to do that, come and find me. Cool. Thanks, guys.